The most important concern of the cow-calf producer is the reproductive efficiency of the herd. Percent calf crop, or the number of calves weaned per cow exposed to breeding, is the single most important economic trait of the cow herd. Many technologies have been developed which allow the cattleman to manipulate the reproductive processes of his cattle and improve the efficiency of the herd. These technologies include estrus synchronization, estrus detection, storage methods for frozen semen and frozen embryos, superovulation, artificial insemination, embryo transfer, and ultrasonic determination of pregnancy. Other technologies like cloning or embryo splitting are also available, but are extremely complicated and expensive. These technologies are best utilized in research situations, but may someday be utilized commonly to propagate animals with superior genetics. In order to make the best use of available technology, cattlemen must understand the basic biological processes involved. The most important of these processes are estrus and the estrus cycle. Estrus is the period of receptivity to mating. This occurs just prior to ovulation and is the time when the cow is able to conceive. Estrus may last from 6 to 14 hours and occurs approximately every 21 days. The regular pattern of hormonal changes that occur in a female's body between one estrus and the next are referred to as the estrus cycle. This cycle lasts about 21 days. Ovulation occurs immediately after estrus. Dr. Clifford Dorn of Rafter D Genetics will describe this cycle. This diagram is the hormone profile from an individual animal during the estrus cycle. It shows all the different hormone activities and as you can see, it's pretty complicated. In real life, this is what's going to happen in the animals. But to get a good understanding, we do not have to have this type of information. We can smooth out these curves, simplify the graph, and give you something a little bit easier to understand. This diagram shows you a more simplified version of that last diagram. The hormones you see here show more of the trends rather than the actual peaks and curves that we see occurring in the natural animal. The important thing to realize here is the actions of progesterone and estradiol or estrogen. You see they act just opposite of each other. Whenever we have high progesterone, we expect to have very low estrogen and LH. Progesterone is produced on the ovary by the corpus luteum. It is the hormone that we have during the stages of pregnancy and during the mid-cycle. When we have high levels of progesterone, the reproductive cycle is pretty much turned off. When we have high levels of estrogen, it is indicating a very high level of estrus activity. A good way to associate these two hormones is estrus and estrogen, progesterone and pregnancy. So that's probably the easiest way to correlate which hormone you should expect during which part of the cycle. As the animal comes into estrus, the follicle that develops on the ovary will produce the estrogen. The estrogen makes the animal come into estrus or show the physical signs of estrus behavior, seeking the bull, wanting to be bred. Once she has this activity going on and comes into the full standing estrus, we will get a rise in LH, which is luteinizing hormone. This will cause a destruction of the follicle and a release of the egg. At the time that the follicle is destroyed, the estrogen level is going to drop because there is no longer a source of estrogen. Once it drops, we begin to form the corpus luteum. As the corpus luteum forms, the progesterone level will rise as it's being produced by that same structure. During the mid part of the cycle, we have high progesterone. If the animal is pregnant, the progesterone level will be maintained at a very high level throughout the pregnancy. In a natural case, around day 16, the animal is going to try to recognize pregnancy. If there is not an embryo or a conceptus in the reproductive tract to signal the uterus, then the animal will naturally release prostaglandin. This is the same hormone that we find in luteolize. Once the prostaglandin is released, it functions to destroy this corpus luteum, the level of progesterone drops, and the animal will start to develop a new follicle and start the cycle over again.
Synchronization of estrus is essential to successful artificial insemination and embryo transfer programs. The synchronization of estrus in cows allows the cattleman to concentrate his efforts when using artificial insemination. This is important if an artificial insemination technician is utilized. If all the cows can be inseminated within a few days, the labor required will be reduced significantly. If the cows were not synchronized, they would likely have to be worked every day in order to detect estrus and inseminate all of them. There are several methods of estrus synchronization. When we look at the synchronization of recipients, there are several different methods that we can use. The first one is synchronization using lutelice or prostaglandin F2 alpha analog. With this type of synchronization program, we normally give two injections over an 11 day interval. Lutelice is only effective on those animals that have a mature corpus luteum, which means those animals that are already between days 6 to 16 of their cycle. Since we don't know the cycle of most recipients, it's most effective to give two injections 11 days apart, and then we do not need to worry about that factor. A single dose of lutelice is usually 25 milligrams, which equals 5 milliliters. Once we give lutelice, the animal should come into estrus within approximately 72 hours. However, the range using lutelice is 48 to 108 hours after the final or second injection. A second method we can use to synchronize estrus is using a progesterone implant. Synchromate B is one such product. With the synchromate implant, we normally give the animal the implant and include an estradiol valerate injection. We will then remove the implant 10 days later and the animal should be in estrus within about 48 hours. The range with synchromate is approximately 30 to 60 hours. In comparison, you will see that much more of the animals will come into estrus over a shorter time frame using the synchromate B than they will with lutelice. Detection of estrus is very important in the utilization of artificial insemination and embryo transfer. Estrus is recognized in cows by the following factors. Swollen vulva, discharge from the vulva, increased activity and standing for mating, or mounting by other cows. This type of behavior is known as standing heat. A good indication that a cow is in heat is the behavior of the young bulls in the herd. If a group of bull calves are following a certain cow rather persistently, she is probably in heat. Another indication of heat is the Fleming response in bulls. This is seen as a curling of the upper lip of the bull after he sniffs the vulva of the cow or puts his nose into her stream of urine. Several aids have been developed to help with the detection of estrus. These include the chin ball marker, the KMAR patch, androgenized cows, and gomer or teaser bulls. The chin ball marker is a device that fits onto the chin of the marker animal. This device looks like a small cup strapped to the chin of the animal. The cup is filled with a colored ink. There is a roller ball that fits into the bottom of the cup. When the marker animal mounts the cow that is in heat, the marker will rub across the cow's back, causing the ball to roll and ink to be released. The KMAR patch contains a small capsule filled with red ink inside a larger white capsule. When the cow is mounted, the smaller capsule will rupture and release the red ink inside. Androgenized cows are often used as heat detectors because cull cows are inexpensive and may be used effectively. These cows are treated with androgens or male hormones that cause the cow to express male sexual behavior. When other cows are in heat, the treated cow will mount them and activate the heat detection systems described earlier. Gomer, or teaser bulls, are used in the same way. These bulls have been surgically altered so that their penis cannot penetrate the cow and accidentally cause an unwanted pregnancy. Artificial insemination gives cattlemen access to semen that would otherwise be unobtainable. They can then take advantage of the genetics of bulls that would be too expensive or unavailable for purchase. Semen collection for freezing and use in artificial insemination is very important. The semen is evaluated for motility, morphology, mortality, and concentration. If the semen is determined to be acceptable, it can then be frozen for storage and later use. Semen collection in the bull can be performed by two methods, by electroejaculation or by using an artificial vagina or AV. 
When using an AV, a teaser cow is used for the bull to mount. The AV itself is prepared in the laboratory where it must be maintained at a warm temperature. The collection valve for the semen is attached to the end of the AV and then it is jacketed in a warm water to maintain the temperature. A small amount of lubricating jelly is then a spread around the opening of the AV. The teaser cow is positioned in a stanchion and blindfolded to keep her calm. Once the bull is allowed to approach the cow, the technician must be standing close by with the AV. Some bulls will approach the cow slowly and will need to be worked up or encouraged to attempt mounting. Once the bull actually mounts the cow, the technician must be fast. He will need to grab the penis and then direct it into the AV where the bull will thrust and then ejaculate. Some bulls are much more rapid than others. The technician must be prepared because the bulls will be different each time. In this instance, the bull goes directly to the cow and ejaculates immediately. Sometimes in order to improve the quality of the semen sample, the technician will false jump a bull. In other words, when the bull jumps the cow, he will grasp the penis but does not insert it into the AV. This will allow the bull to produce the accessory fluid, which is not recovered. The technician will then insert the penis into the AV and collect a, a purer semen sample. This will greatly improve the quality of the semen sample many times. Once the semen sample is collected, it is then carried into the laboratory for processing. The processing in the laboratory begins with an evaluation of the sample. A technician will take a small amount of the semen, place it on a warm slide, and then evaluate it under a microscope. There are some minimum values which the semen must meet in order to be viable enough for freezing. Generally, we expect at least 55% motility as a minimum value. 75% of the cells must be normal. This would be a morphological evaluation. Both of these evaluations are performed by the technician using the microscope. Once the semen passes the initial evaluation, a concentration check must be used to determine the actual amount of sperm in the sample. A spectral photometer is used to measure the concentration of the semen sample. Using the reading from the spectral photometer, the technician can very easily calculate exactly how many sperm cells are in the sample and this would then give her an indication of how much additional volume of extender to use to prepare the sample. The calculations for the dilutions are derived from the reading on the spectrophotometer and then the amount of actual extender that will be used. Each straw needs to contain approximately 40 million live normal cells per one half cc straw. The extender needs to be added to the semen sample very slowly. Do not add the semen to the extender. Once the semen and extender are combined, it needs to be equilibrated in a 37 degree centigrade water bath. This water bath is then placed in a cold room where it will cool down for approximately two hours. While the semen is equilibrating in the cold room, at this time the technician can print the straws. The information on the straws would generally include the name of the sire, the registration number, the date or collection number, and also the uh, code for the particular company freezing the semen. Once the straws have been printed, they also need to be cooled down for approximately 45 minutes. This will take them to the same temperature that the semen will ultimately reach. After the minimum of two hours equilibration for the semen, the straws are then filled. After filling, the semen will equilibrate an additional time so that we have a total amount of five hours equilibration in the cold room. This will include the initial two hours for the preliminary equilibration. Once the total equilibration time has elapsed, the semen can then be frozen in liquid nitrogen vapor. It should be frozen in a static vapor for approximately 30 minutes. Once the straws are frozen, they can then be plunged directly into the liquid nitrogen for deep storage. The technician would generally load the straws into the goblets on the specific canes for each bull and then place the entire canes and goblets into the liquid nitrogen for storage. After the freezing process is complete, one sample of the semen needs to be checked to identify whether or not it has survived the process. We need to have a minimum of 25% motility post-thaw to be a good sample. This will give us enough live normal cells to perform an insemination with. We will now demonstrate the artificial insemination procedure in the cow. As we prepare our AI kit, we begin by removing our AI gun 
and having the AI sheets ready to go. We will need to have a paper towel to dry off the straw of semen. We also have a sidle cutter to cut the straw. The temperature of the water bath needs to be 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The semen is stored in liquid nitrogen. We will remove a single straw and place it in the water bath. We then need to seal back up the nitrogen tank. The semen needs to thaw for approximately 45 seconds. Once the 45 seconds has elapsed, the straw can be removed from the thermos, dried off with the paper towel, and then identified. Care should be taken to protect the straw from sunlight. We then place the straw into the AI gun, putting the cotton plug end first. Using the sidle cutter, we will clip off the other end of the straw. The gun is then inserted into the AI sheath. The sheath needs to be locked down onto the AI gun using the O-ring provided. For maximum benefit from AI, we prefer to check each straw of semen to assure that we are actually putting live semen into the cow. This is done using a standard compound microscope. A single drop of semen can be placed on the slide It can then be covered with a small cover slip, and we can evaluate for motility. This is a very quick procedure which can have major benefits. Assuring that we are using live semen can add greatly to your AI program. Many times semen can be damaged during the handling process and also during shipment or storage. When you are working with valuable semen, it's best to be sure. We will use a palpation sleeve, which we would turn inside out. This will assure that the seam is on the inside and does not do damage to the rectum. We can now go out to the cow to do the insemination. For the insemination process, we first need to palpate the cow per rectum. We then want to use a paper towel and lightly clean off the vulva. The insemination gun is then inserted into the vulva, up through the vagina, and we will reach the actual cervix. Using our hand in the rectum, we will grasp hold of the cervix, manipulate the catheter slowly through the cervix, position the tip of the gun so that it just enters into the body of the uterus. As it slips into the body of the uterus, slowly push the plunger and deposit the semen. This particular animal is an embryo donor and so we will use two straws of semen. For routine AI, you normally only use one insemination. The second straw of semen is placed in exactly the same location. The insemination process is very rapid in the cow. It should only take one to two minutes. To have an effective artificial insemination program, it's very important that your animals are very gentle. The calm disposition represented here aids greatly in the effectiveness. Embryo transfer teamed with estrosynchronization, superovulation, and artificial insemination yields many more offspring from superior matings than would be available through natural breeding. 
Superovulation increases the number of eggs released during one estrus cycle and is accomplished through the use of follicle stimulating hormone. This technology is especially useful when performed in conjunction with artificial insemination and embryo transfer. A cow that has been superovulated and shows standing heat can be artificially inseminated and the resulting embryos can be transferred to other cows for gestation. This is a wonderful advancement that allows the producer to greatly increase the numbers of calves from superior females. Freezing semen and embryos makes shipping and storage much easier. It also allows for the use of the semen or embryos long after collection. Frozen embryos and semen are much easier to export than bulls or fully developed calves. In many countries, there are strict quarantine laws for imported animals. They must first undergo disease testing, and a waiting period is not unusual. These precautions are designed to prevent disease spread from one country to another. Pregnancy in cows is a major criteria for keeping or culling them. Pregnancy is often determined at weaning time. Cows that have not rebred should be culled in order to keep a high reproductive average in the cow herd. Early pregnancy diagnosis through the use of ultrasound facilitates the culling of open cows by determining their non-pregnant state early in the post-breeding season. Rectal palpation is also a reliable method of pregnancy determination. However, early pregnancies are difficult to diagnose because of the small size of the fetus. As we first enter the rectum, the first thing we're going to notice is the bladder. This large black structure is the bladder. Realizing with ultrasound diagnosis, we are looking at a gray scale where fluid will appear black and dense tissue such as bone will appear very white and then anything in between will be different scales of gray. So as we go past the bladder, holding the probe down, we actually run into the uterus. Now we're picking up fluid in the uterus. So you can see the small pocket of fluid there on the top. We go in a little bit farther and we gently rotate the probe so that we can see all angles and you can see different pockets of fluid in the uterus there as the horns are twisting around. Only the pregnant animals will have large pockets of fluid like this. There you have a very good indication that we do have a pregnancy. This is a 31 day pregnancy. Okay, we're up. Okay, there we have in the center of the screen, we have one fetus. We have a black circle with the white portion inside of it. You can see the membranes floating around now as the animal moves. Okay, now we rotate the probe to try to get the actual fetus. There's the actual fetus. It's that small white portion right in the center of the black fluid. Okay, there we can see the heart beating in the white portion. You can gently see the valves opening and closing. It's just a rhythmic beating. Now as we go in a little bit farther, now we're just following out one particular horn. As you can see the fluid traveling throughout the entire horn there. Okay, now we have located another conceptus. Each of these animals received multiple embryos. There in the top center of the screen, we have the fluid-filled cavity, and within that, right there, we have another fetus. And you can see the heart beating once again. This is a second fetus. It's different from the first one. So this animal is carrying twins. The nice thing about diagnostic ultrasonography is we can go in on these very early pregnancies and determine two things. First of all, yes, the animal is pregnant, and secondly, that it is a viable pregnancy. We actually pick up a heartbeat. Another important thing is, by using this type of technology, we have very little disturbance to the fetus itself. So we are very unlikely to disturb an early pregnancy, whereas rectal palpation, actually physically trying to feel for the uh, fetus, can sometimes cause problems. 
across the top of the screen and down the side, we have the marks that indicate centimeters. So this can give you an idea that the size of this fetus is less than two centimeters. And so on just rectal palpation, it'd be very difficult to determine that this animal was pregnant. Being a virgin heifer, she has very small horns. There is not a lot of fluid contained within the horns. So it is very difficult upon palpation. Ultrasonography is a very effective, very reliable, and safe method of determining extremely early pregnancies. When you get to later stage pregnancies, we're talking greater than, say, 60 days, ultrasound does not really have a big advantage. It's much quicker and easier to go in strictly by rectal palpation, determine that there is a pregnancy there, and come back out. The ultrasound, once again, is preferable on the very early pregnancies where we could cause some disruption by manual palpation. For rectal palpation of the cow, we need to use palpation sleeves and some type of general lube. It is best if you take your sleeves out and you want to invert them so that the actual rough edge is to the inside. So we can fill them with air, grasp them, invert them, and then the seam now is located on the inside and will not be rough or irritating on the rectum. Once you place the sleeve on your hand, use a small amount of lube. We can gently massage the lube all the way across the back of our hand. Placing your fingers together, go into the rectum and in one smooth thrust, go all the way up to your elbow. You can now reach down and gently feel the reproductive tract. If you're determining pregnancy, it should just take you a few minutes to locate the uterus and determine whether the animal is pregnant or open. Starting at the brim of the pelvis, you can feel across to see if you can find the uterus. If not, slowly pull your hand back until you locate the uterus. On the open animals, the uterus will be way back in the pelvic cavity. Reptile palpation is one way that we can determine gestation in cattle. An effective way of judging age is by using fetal size. Now we're going to talk to you about using the actual fetal size to determine age of that particular pregnancy. When we start off on the very small pregnancies, approximately here, we have two conceptuses of approximately 30 to 45 days of gestation. The large one being closer to 45 days. At this stage, it is contained within a vesicle. The vesicle itself is a fluid-filled cavity, and it will have another layer of membranes around it, which will then attach into the uterus. At this age, we have a very small size of the fetus, and it's very difficult to palpate the actual developing fetus inside here. We go more by the amount of fluid that we have within the reproductive tract, specifically in the pregnant horn. As the fetus grows in age, the development begins, and we get an enlargement here of the fetus. As we see on this animal, we are getting quite a bit of membranes that begin to develop. As we go along farther age, we're looking here at approximately 60 days of gestation. So between 45 to 60 days of gestation, we have very slight differences in the actual fetal size, but there is a large amount of difference in the amount of fluid that's going to be contained within the reproductive tract. Now as we continue development on up in here to 70, 75, 80, and then ultimately 90 days, the fetus will then begin to increase in size much more rapidly. As we get to the larger stages here of development, it's very easy to physically palpate the fetus and estimate age, particularly by that method, actually palpating the fetus and seeing how big it is. When we look at the early stages here, we consider it the size of a mouse. When we get up to 75 to 90 days, the fetus should be approximately the size of a fairly good sized rat. Now, as we continue the development, the fetus again will continue developing at a pretty outstanding rate. When we get here, we're looking at approximately 100 to 120 days of gestation. In fact, this entire line of fetuses here are somewhere between that 100 to 120 days of gestation. So you see we get quite a bit of enlargement in development as we go along in just a period of 30 days there. As we continue the development, the fetus is going to get much larger. Here we have one approximately 120 days with the development continuing here 
through approximately maybe 150 days. Once we get past 150 days, then the fetus is going to be pretty far down in the pelvic cavity and be very difficult to palpate. But here you have a fetus between 150 to 170 days. This fetus is very far over the brim of the pelvis. It's palpable in that we have an animal approximately the size of a small to a medium-sized dog. As we continue developing here at 160 on up to about 180 days, the fetus is going to take up a large amount of the pelvic cavity and then it is very easy to palpate. When we're trying to estimate age on fetal development strictly by size, there's some things that can limit us and kind of confuse us to a degree. One thing is the actual positioning of the fetus in the reproductive tract. Once it falls over and out of reach, it's difficult for us to determine a true size of this entire structure. So many times we might just go by the size of the head where we can reach down and estimate strictly by the size of that developing head. So here we'd say, yes, we have a large head. It's fully developed and it's approximately the size of a dog's. So we would say it's in excess of probably six months in age. As we get to the later stages of development, it becomes very difficult to, for us to determine an exact age of the fetus. When we look at animals like this, we have something that is so large that once again, we can't easily palpate and determine an exact size. And so again, we have to go strictly by recognizing some structures. One of those methods, as I said, was to actually palpate over the head and try to determine the approximate size of the developing head. The other thing is we can actually grab hold of the legs and try to determine size by the length of the developing legs. As we go to the farther stages of development, the two fetuses that we have here are already starting to develop a hair coat. And you can see it's at a different degree on the two animals. However, these two animals are approximately the same age in gestation. There's probably no more than two weeks difference in their development. When we look at the animals, we see a big difference in developing size. And this is one thing that's associated with breed type. When we look at this animal, it's a very small Hereford calf, whereas here we have a larger Holstein calf. So we cannot use size by itself as a factor for determining the actual age. There are a number of other things we have to look at. As we go back down to these smaller fetuses again, many times it's not critical for us to determine the difference between, say, this fetus and one out here. For most management practices, if we can tell the producer within approximately 30 days of gestation how old the animal is, then that should be sufficient enough. Combining that data with their calving uh, records from the previous year and exposure dates of the bulls or insemination dates, they should be able to estimate the particular calving.